Okay, very good morning everyone. Tuesday the 21st of March. Let's get the, the briefing underway and looking at the charts here this morning, this is kind of what I was talking about in the, the text for the strategy that we issued yesterday and that when you came in tomorrow morning, i.e. this morning, the charts would pretty much tell you a story without really looking at the news in terms of the Euro's reaction to what the results of last night's uh, first televised presidential debate in France would have would have meant and you know you can see the market having shot higher from really half past 11 last night and the reopening in futures and then we've moved higher again early when Europe came into market all suggesting then that even without looking at the news you know your relief rally of a fairly strong nature in the euro currency spells then that likelihood is that Macron performed very well last night and uh, and a bit of a relief rally I guess in the fact that given that he's a, a relative novice especially in comparison to the likes of Filon and Le Pen that there was a bit of an outside risk that potentially uh, he might not have been able to hold up to the pressure last night but we'll have a quick look at this and as you can see from the charts this morning the market's telling you that they liked what they saw from the most popular person in terms of what the second round polling is suggesting at the moment with Macron expected to beat Le Pen in the final runoff. So we've had a quick look up at R2 already. You can see here as well the kind of timing of the events and this coinciding with really the interpretation of the news itself. There would have been those people that stayed last night to watch the entire thing and that started at 8 p.m. last night but if you were watching that last night, you were in for a bit of a long one because it did last for three and a half hours. Um, covered all types of topics, but what was really essential here was the ILAB poll, which is basically a snap poll surveying just shy of 1,200 people immediately after uh, the televised debate finished. And Macron was seen as the winner of the debate at 29%. Uh, Mélenchon second with 20% and back down in third was Le Pen and Filon both coming joint third uh, with Benoit Hamon coming fifth at 11% so Le Pen the biggest kind of threat if you'd like if it goes down to the runoff between the two came in third with 19 Macron at 29% so that's a pretty actually surprising and I think decisive victory in what has seen in other countries like in the likes of the UK and in the US when the televised debates get underway um, you know you've seen all types of, of things occur and, and public opinion sway obviously the one thing to, to keep in mind if you remember what Trump was like in the presidential televised debates he was absolutely shocking in pretty much all three rounds and yet he still won so you know, this isn't to say that it's a, a done deal, but in for the here and now, the intraday reaction, the markets liking what they heard from Macron last night, and what you're seeing would be termed as a kind of relief rally at the median immediately upon reopening a futures trade last night. Europe comes in and then just hits it again, taking it up further from the point of when Europe comes into the market around 6 a.m. our time. And so we've had a quick look up to this R2 here. But, uh, you know, you're looking at a move really of about a full point in range uh, which I'd say starts to become priced into what the uh, what has occurred a bit more longer dated looking at a daily continuation chart of the the euro and it's been obviously very interesting because it wasn't that long ago we were talking about the lower bound the break of 105 what that meant you know around those levels was that kind of late 2015 low that early 2015 loan if that broke maybe we would get an extension to the downside a lot of banks earlier in or well, the end of last year were talking about the prospect of parity in the euro dollar pair that was because you had a lot of stress over the italian banking situation you had looming concerns about a le pen victory on the back of the trump victory and so What's happened is quite, a, a, quite an about turnaround here on a number of different reasons. And technically it's interesting because up here you can see as we get towards the kind of mid 108 type region, we start to come back up towards year to date highs and also the late 2016 highs that we had in early December. 
break above here then starts to maybe open up a bit of further upside at least to 110 next in a slightly longer time frame but the failure to really break to the downside has seen a cut quite a number of wall street banks start to revise up their euro dollar forecast and quite a few banks are starting to move away from those calls for parity uh, one being that actually as we've talked about several times the the technicality of le pen winning is is highly improbable albeit still possible then you've got inflation re-emerging in the eurozone which is prompting the EC ecb to become uh, a little bit less dovish and then things like the italian banking situation seems to have just um, fallen off the agenda if you like so to speak so what you've had here is a pretty decent recovery in that kind of range that we've had at the moment and through really 2017 since we've come back in this year and we're just testing the upper bound of that at the moment i would say though if are we going to punch aggressively higher from here i would say probably the likelihood is as we go in towards the beginning of april and then through those weeks April through to the end of that month obviously tensions will probably rise irrespective of the fact that Macron might start to widen his lead over Le Pen as people will still be slightly positioned for the uh, you know protection against the what if scenario and Le Pen wins but technically and fundamentally it's been quite interesting developments of late for the euro currency okay quick look at some other things um, moving away from that is you can see the DAX has gapped up this morning again this is a similar situation this is just the the market relief if you like because uh, a Macron win a more centrist view would be uh, avoiding a worse shock scenario for financial markets uh, I did read some Deutsche Bank analysis and they basically put out a global cross-asset survey to their investors so all their institutional clients and some of the feedback was that in summary a Le Pen or a left win is perhaps unsurprisingly strongly associated with negative or very negative risk asset outcomes whereas a center win is mainly associated with positive but not very positive outcomes so that's the kind of way most black and white to look at the market reaction to these types of situations. So you've had that initial gap up again, similar type of vein to the euro, just relief that um, Macron and then more centrist view won out last night. Um, How has that looked in other assets? Well, if you look at gold, actually did see some quite aggressive selling pressure overnight fairly aggressive move to the downside i'd say this is probably a byproduct as well of the generally thinner liquidity at that time in overnight early asia pack session broke through as well um, the respective s1 which kind of coincided with that low point that we had around midday yesterday so we snapped lower uh, and we've just come back now to that s1 level just as i'm talking so looking to just narrow some of that initial downtick uh, and then in fixed income, T notes lower by about four ticks in part. Again, it's kind of moderate risk on tone uh, emanating from that situation from the debate last night. OK, moving on, I just wanted to bring up a, a graphic in which we had shared with you before, but I think it's quite pertinent now in the context of post the, the new Fed world of communication where we had that kind of dovish hike if you like on Wednesday last week where they increased rates as very much expected by 25 basis points but uh, the market kind of misinterpreted if you like the positioning and was caught a little off guard by the pretty much non-existent movement in the dot plot projections uh, that accompanied the actual statement itself now what you're looking at here are all of the Fed members and the ones in blue are the voting FOMC members so arguably the more important the others are the rotating ones that will then come in and out uh, as the years go by now the scale here is up to down is reliability so how much is it what they say they actually stick to and then becomes policy and so on and so forth more reliable obviously Yellen who tends to speak 
to a less degree, only speaks really at, at official formal functions, at big things like the semi-annual testimony, the actual press conferences and so on and so forth. She tends to be the most reliable. Who would be then the next most reliable? Well, obviously those who can't afford to be as outlying in their view. So then you get Stanley Fisher and Dudley, and then you kind of go down the order, and then you get um, someone like Kashkari, who has recently jumped to become extremely dovish, and he's right down at the bottom. Left to right, so left, you're looking at more hawkish, uh, so you've got people like Mester, and then on the far right, you've got people like Brainard. So that's the kind of scale to make it make a bit more sense. And the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out and recapping is because we've had a couple of Fed speakers. And as I said in the rundown yesterday, we've got 10 Fed speakers this week. And that's a very large amount. And the reason why the Fed probably do things like this, and it's already pre-planned as part of their strategy, is that they know that last week the market may have over kind of positioned itself in interpreting what the Fed said as being too dovish, i.e. the Fed, in essence, have done exactly what they said they would do. They would raise interest rates, which they did, and they're sticking to their path of committing to still raising interest rates three times this year, of which they've already done one. But what the market's done is it's drastically kind of swung back in being very dovishly positioned again under uh, of a more shallow path than what the Fed are saying. So what do they do? They already schedule in a number of speakers the week after to then start talking to the market again to make sure that that divergence between what the Fed are forecasting and where the market is priced doesn't get too wide. Otherwise, then, it's going to be more difficult to communicate than impending policy moves going forward. So last night, we've had Fed's Chicago Fed's Evans, who's made the case for the Fed hiking two or three more times this year. So again, that's more hawkish because he's talking potentially then four for the year, which is not currently uh, what, the, um, what the projections are, which is for three. So don't forget as well, Evans is this chap here. So he's sitting much more on the, on the dovish side. So to hear that type of commentary uh, is quite notable. You've also had Fed's Harker, which is this chap down here who tends to be more hawkish anyway. So Harker spoke and said he expects the Fed to overshoot the 2% inflation target a little bit and that he would not rule out a faster or slower pace of hikes in 2017. So again, they're, they're kind of erring on the side of being a little bit more on the hawkish side. And I would say this is them playing the market verbally to try and manage expectations to align with how the Fed want them, which may be they feel the market kind of overperceived it to be dovish, whereas the Fed feel they're still optimistic that the economy remains on track. Then you had this guy down the bottom, Kashkari. Now, if you remember what the dot plots look like, um, you can pretty much assume that his picture, you could pin on these dots down the bottom. And you can see how far away it is where he is from his policy thinking that the end of 2019 he actually does not see interest rates moving from where they are um, from this present day. Whereas there are other people at the Fed who foresee rates just knocking on the door of 4%. You know, you, can you imagine what this conversation is like when they're all sat around a boardroom at their two-day uh, meetings that they have at the Fed? You know, this chap down here, way more dovish in view than the rest of the, the kind of cluster of Fed members who all tend to be more... Um, leaning what well, as we go in towards more present times much higher than where he is at the moment so he spoke as well yesterday and he said we do not have a high inflation threat around the corner and that I would be very surprised if core inflation reaches 2% this year so that's completely bang on trend if you like of what you would expect him to say so the most interesting one then is probably Evans because he tends to sit more, as you can see, on the dovish side, and he sounded more hawkish in a sense that he said we could do two, possibly three hikes. So the others have kind of more fit within the spectrum of where they normally sit. This is why knowing your Fed speakers and knowing what their policy intonation is by the norm will better or make it easier for you to react quicker if you were to see something. 
The interesting thing is though, the market not really buying too much into the hype of the Fed speak, erring on the side of being more hawkish, which means then from the other Fed members that come out speaking for the rest of this week, I would expect them to sound more hawkish. Because if you look at the dollar index this morning, it's down about a third of a percent and it's sub 100. This obviously coming in the context as well of a resurgent euro, which we're just making a push on R2 now on the upside at session highs. So you, so euro dollar up, cable also higher as well this morning. And so the dollar back under pressure again. So again, you can see how I'm already forward thinking to how the Fed strategy might play out and therefore I can react quicker as towards comments that they might say. Okay, so just having a, a quick look at OPEC because there was a very interesting move that we saw yesterday and with OPEC, Saudi Arabia is really key at the moment because Saudi Arabia yesterday there was a source report in Reuters where the source report essentially in a nutshell oil producers increasingly favor extending beyond June a pact on reducing crude supply to balance the market sources within the group said although Russia and other non-members need to remain part of the initiative what happened when that came out well let me just put this back onto a minute chart and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about when that actual comment hit we scroll back to the afternoon this was the actual reaction when that comment hit and I was I was monitoring obviously I've got a risk sheet that I can monitor all the trainees in the various different groups and what was interesting is that a couple of, couple of people got caught caught up in some of this price action yesterday so what you saw was you know if you're trading crews you've got the ladder in front of you inevitably what you tend to see is you see an explosive move higher in the price the ladder also mimics that move in its momentum then you kind of look for the news and then the squawk in that instance was maybe a couple of seconds until the the, the kind of squawker spotted it said it and then he's been able to announce it and then we've heard it you know even that being a two second process the move a large portion of it has occurred now really you can tackle a trade like this I guess in one of two ways and I heard Piers talking about this a few months ago to some of the guys about a Bank of England situation which was similar and the two ways of tackling this is is, is twofold one either you commit and are ultra aggressive and just on the size of the move and momentum alone you go into that trade Obviously, that's extremely high risk and is more akin to someone who has you know, a, a healthy appetite and ability to be able to psychologically commit themselves in that quicker fashion. So it tends to lend its hand to someone more experienced, someone like Will, who you all know well, and his trading style, for instance, he probably would have committed to a move like that. Then the news comes out, it kind of validates the move that he sees then he plays it accordingly probably going in with some size and then scaling out as the the market came up to that pivot actually though the the, the actual trade here for the more i would say other approach to trading this was when it got to pivot and it touching pivot kind of makes sense from a behavioral point of view and this is quite often what you see in reaction to uh, kind of news headlines and the way the market moves is that the market immediately moves higher in aggressive fashion and because of the pivot points that are already in existence and that being the pivot level on the day the market just wants to push it to that point and then they start to bail out of that long position it's kind of a target psychologically on the charts to, to take the price to but if you actually look at the comment that came out it was very much along the lines that OPEC are leaning toward a, a cut to um, the agreements in the summer but non-OPEC members need to be in and that still has not been determined so actually when you look at the news on balance and you think about it a cut is completely null and void unless Russia are taking part and then the actual article itself said that really that decision has not been taken yet and the energy minister Novak who spoke last week said it's way too early to be talking about cuts what happened then actually the prices continued to grind back and we went all the way back to where exactly back to net neutral zero on the move 
because ultimately when you digest the actual news on offer, within about half an hour the entire move's been paired. Now one thing to keep in mind of course which I strongly suggest that you keep a, uh, an ear out for on the, on the squawk this afternoon is any comment from Russia. That's what I'm looking for uh, in essence that what have Russia got to say about this? Do they continue to stick to the same theme as last week whereby um, it's too early to talk about it? Do they want to? What's the objective here? Do Russia want to put the Gulf nations under a bit more pain in order to, you know, is this a bit of a power play, especially with the US continuing to ramp up output, which we saw with the rig count going up again at the end of last week, and those net long positions in WCI crude being cut back uh, in that recent measured week, but most on record as people become more bearish on that output situation in the US and the oversupply in the market. Now, in the here and now, we're, we have managed to recoup a large portion of those moves from yesterday. And in fact, we're just making a move here above R1. And so definitely, I'd just say in the context of things, we're, and those who've traded oil long enough will know that swings and roundabouts from OPEC comments from oil ministers uh, and the like, when it starts to pick up pace, tends to be some very volatile swings that you get in oil. And so definitely an asset that you need to be keeping a, a close eye on developments in that nature. Okay, another thing quickly that's kind of people have very quickly forgotten about, but I've seen a very interesting article which I've retweeted this morning if you want to read in more detail. But that's about the Dutch situation. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, but there's a couple of interesting points and statistics that I've seen this morning. So essentially having had... Uh, the Freedom Party fall by the wayside. What you'll see here is these are the six real main parties that may form a coalition in the Netherlands because that's very much where this is heading with no one with an outright majority. What you'll realize here is that there's no picture of Gert Velders and the Freedom Party. Now that's because even though he was the second largest party with 20 seats in the Dutch election, there is zero chance of him being in a coalition after Rutt had ruled him out weeks ago. The others have also said the same. So he's not going to be able to be part of this group because they're all very strong worded weeks and months ago that they would not team with him due to the, um, his far right views and policies. Uh, in total, though, there's 13 parties in Parliament. That will be the highest number since 1972. But in terms of the ruling government in its coalition to form a majority, um, Gert Velders would not be part of that. Now, what you're looking out for here is Bloomberg have collected over 100 policy positions for Dutch political parties across roughly 30 key election topics, from immigration and integration to pension age and taxes to determine which possible coalitions have the most policies in common. Now, as you can see here, that looking at this, so a coalition needs essentially, this is the magic number, 76 seats needed uh, for a majority. And this is looking at the probabilities then of RUT teaming up with other parties. So what's looking most probable is with the CDA, the DC66 and the GL probably lower would be the Christian Union and the Labour Party, which took a, a huge um, backward step in that latest uh, election that we had last week. Now, the next chart here, these are the most policy aligned combinations when looking at the possible four, five, six or seven party coalitions, which would ha have a majority basically in the lower house. So a coalition with an average policy overlap of 50%, meaning all partners share half their respective policy positions with each other. So the most likely then in that situation, the only one that actually edges above 50% would be the VVD, the CDA, the D66, the GL and the PVDA. So actually that would give them a pretty strong 94 combined seats in a 150 seat lower house. So if you are interested then, it's quite a good graphic. These are the various breakdowns in what a coalition would likely look at. And when doing uh, quite neat analysis over various different policy positions and the cohesion amongst that, 
that's seen as the most likely credible coalition going forward. Again, none of this is really, I'd say, market moving at this point, but from a macro point of view, um, you can see the complexity on these multi-party coalitions could take a number of weeks to get into place. Hence the average of around 72 days it's taken for the Netherlands to sort themselves out domestically in this situation dating back since World War II. Okay, moving on, as it's just coming up to nine o'clock, quick look at the calendar for today. You've got one of the bigger events for the UK and sterling currency. Um, cable is positive this morning, up around 40 pips, but it's being um, second place to the euro dollar pair, which is outperforming on the back of Macron. Probably a lot of participants are waiting then this CPI number. CPI, arguably inflation metrics of the UK economy, are the most important metric that traders and the Monetary Policy Committee alike are looking at at the moment when it comes uh, to UK economics. Alongside this, PPI, core RPI, the house price index, public sector net borrowing, all of this, the focus will be very much on the headline year on year CPI and the core CPI reading. Now, just having a look at inflation, now, if you remember last month, we had a print at 1.8%. And although that continued this fairly aggressive upward trend of the re-emergence of inflation back towards, of course, target of 2%, this was actually below expectations of one9 So actually, it was a little bit softer last time. But putting it in a bit more context, what you're looking at here is the general economist forecast of where inflation is heading. Now, inflation today on a median estimate well let's have a look year on year is expected at 2.1 percent so we are in fact expected to breach the bank of england's target on a year on year reading today to print around here now that's not massively surprising because even the bank of england's projections themselves the cpi peaking in about a year's time at 2.8 percent which is largely where economists forecasts also uh, reside now the question mark here and how to trade the figure later will be determined by if it's expected at 2.1 and we get say 2.4 percent then obviously the upper bound of where the people will start to think that inflation will go will probably be a steeper trajectory here before it starts to peter out that will be need to be factored and the pound repositioned actually just taking a look at the pound now as i'm speaking just shot higher there i'm sure some of you are looking at that at the moment that's on a minute candle here We've just spiked about 20 pips. Uh, no news that I can see on Twitter or on the news feeds, but what I'd say is that keep in mind that you know not a lot of people are going to be in the market ahead of the inflation reading and such the, uh, the illiquid nature then of the market tends to exacerbate some of the price movements become quite wide and sharp. Um, the other thing as well to keep in mind, and this is now being investigated by the authorities, is the pre-release movement you tend to get in the sterling currency. Now, if cable starts to go bid still all the way through this R1 and some more, what that would suggest then, going on the balance of how economic data in the UK has tended to come out, is that this CPI number is probably going to be above expectations. So upside beyond there, we'll be keeping an eye on the high from yesterday morning that was printed at 24.65. Uh, we'll look at that again in more detail ahead of that release. But I'm also just seeing the DAX snapping through the low of having closed the gap on the futures through pivot, just a bit of an extended run back towards the low print of yesterday. Uh, so just keeping an eye on that level as well. Okay, so UK inflation then is going to be a key reading that's coming out shortly. Moving swiftly on, though, in the US, it's fairly quiet today, but keep an eye out for any OPEC source comments. They typically tend to come out in the late afternoon in terms of timing. I would also keep an eye on the Opinion Way poll for France, which normally comes out around 10.45, 11, both today and going forward for this week to see how public opinion sways after that televised debate, of which Macron, according to Snap Exit polls, came out on top. And then you've got your crude oil infantry numbers coming out later this evening. You've also got Bank of England's Mark Carney is scheduled to be speaking at 10 o'clock. But I've jumped on the Bank of England website to verify exactly what it is that he's covering. He is indeed speaking. But this is about Banking Standards Board 
worthy of trust, law, ethics and culture in banking panel discussions. So this is not about monetary policy and not about the economy. I would not be expecting any comments of that regard from him. Nonetheless, I would keep half an eye at the turn of 10 o'clock as well. The CPI data would likely dominate for sterling traders. You do have, though, a cluster of Fed speakers, and as we've discussed, these are important to monitor going forward. Dudley, George and Mester all on the docket. Dudley probably the most interesting, given that he's a voter and a leaning dove. OK, guys, going to leave it at that. Let you get on with it. The inflation data coming up in 25 minutes is going to be quite key for the morning's release. So good luck with that, and I'll see you in the chat room. Thank you.